Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Akhilesh Tandekar, and today this is our 63rd Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network. And uh, for this uh, session, um, ARDS and with the pregnancy perspective, Dr. Consultant uh, Critical Care at Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai, and he has also had been, uh, you know, involved in uh, uh, heart transplants and ECMO procedures. He is former formerly trained in uh, ECMO procedures from La Petit Hospital. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I welcome Dr. Gunadhar. I also welcome uh, our moderators today, uh, Dr. Kedar Toraskar, who is Director of Critical Care Services at Bocard Hospital, South Mumbai. Uh, welcome, sir. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Sauro. Uh, uh, he's from uh, Alchemist Hospital. Uh, Delhi uh, and Dr. Saurav also has a lot of uh, publications and research articles published to his name and he has been actively interested in uh, academics and uh, he is also one of the active member of uh, Onco Critical Care Society. Welcome Dr. Saurav. And Thank you Dr. Uh, with us, we have Dr. Sandeep Agrawal, who is head of the department of, and um, you know, Dr. Soro has also been a great academician. And I welcome, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, I welcome Dr. Sandeep Agrawal. Welcome, Dr. Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you so much. And without without uh, wasting time, I would like to request uh, Dr. Gunadhar to initiate the presentation. Uh, his topic on ARDS and uh, perspective in the pregnancy. Over to you, Dr. Gunadhar. Yeah, thank you, Atlas. Uh, uh, so thank you for all the uh, lovely introduction. And uh, I think all these classes are made for our uh, DRDNB and fellowship students. So that is the all the eminent uh, panelists are here. So I request all of them to uh, uh, put the questions and uh, solve the doubts, if any. And we'll be very precise and uh, we'll try to finish it within 45 minutes, all the concept of ARDS. And this is a basically case-based discussion. Uh, so without further delay, I'll start the session. So basically, this, I'll go through all these uh, uh, following headings, like uh, the evolving concept of ARDS, different uh, definitions, the epidemiology, in particularly in the obstetric patients, Respiratory changes, which is very important in uh, pregnancy, the anatomic and physiologic, the classification of ARDS, the pathophysiology, different practical clinical pulse, uh, the etiology of ARDS, particularly in obstetrics and pregnancy, uh, the pregnancy associated and unrelated cases, guidelines based approach, therapies, prognosis, outcome, and uh, then the take home message. So, with this, let me uh, start with a small case. So, this is basically a 35 year old female. Uh, who was presented to us with gestational age of 32 weeks with medical history, no significant medical history and uh, the first pregnancy. Lifestyle, non-smoker and no other comorbidity, no history of substance abuse. The pregnancy history is uncomplicated up to the third trimester. Family history is not known history of respiratory disorder. These are the very important points uh, uh, to ask for the history basically. The presenting complaint is basically it's a nut cell. So she rushed to the emergency with severe shortness of breath. She was previously healthy during her pregnancy, but she suddenly developed the symptoms over the past 24 hours. So these are all sudden onset. She is restless. She is tachypneic with respiratory rate almost going up to 40. She is tachycardic with heart rate of 130 per minute. The blood pressure is on the higher side. Lungs, auscultation, bilateral crackles. She is hypoxic on uh, room air on SpO2 of 80%. And she is using the accessory muscles of respiration. So this is the brief history. So why this uh, this uh, alteration of the respiratory system in pregnancy is very important to know because many of the pathologies are basically diagnosed on the basis of the different uh, physiological and anatomical alterations pertaining to that clinical condition. So these are the different alterations in pregnancy like alteration in the rib cage, alteration in the diaphragm, alteration of the diaphragm, muscles, lung, volumes and capacities, chest wall, geometry, lung mechanics like resistance, conductance and compliance. So in a nut cell, if we see the basically, uh, if we go step by step approach, so the rib cage, if you see the, the, there is a widening of the rib cage and the angle, angle which the rib sub, 
means it ex, uh, it's the, basically the angle of the rib cage with the sternum it get extended from the 68 degree to almost 103 degree and that is basically the compensatory mechanism to accommodate the growing fetus and the resting position of the diaphragm is elevated up to 5 cm uh, it is basically an upward displacement and all this leads to increased abdomen dimensions and increased rib cage dimension this is basically a anatomical adaptation of the normal pregnancy and if you see the diaphragm uh, uh, the structure basically there is a increase in the lateral diameter of the diaphragm compared to the anteroposterior diaphragm diameter and overall the diameter of the diaphragm get increased there is if you go by the lung volume and capacities we know that all the volumetric functions all the volumetric functions whether it is expiratory reserve volume residual volume the functional residual volume all the volumetric functions are abnormal so there is a decrease in the expiratory reserve volume the residual volume the functional residual volume and all these parametric functions are relatively normal so if we tell a pregnant woman to do a normal spirometric functions most of the times you get a normal absolutely normal value that is why this is very important because if any decline in the spirometric function will point you towards a significant uh, disease in the respiratory system so the fvc the fpv1 by fvc ratio the peak expiratory flow rate almost they are normal that is why when there is a decrease in the fvc or fpv1 ratio or peak expiratory flow rate probably there is some abnormal condition which one has to suspect and this is a normal uh, reduction in the volumetric function so which is expected as uh, the inspiratory capacity to compensate this decrease in the volumetric function goes up and uh, to compensate but surprisingly the chest wall geometry and the displacement relatively normal and the vital capacity is relatively normal so it is comparable to the uh, non pregnant state all the lung mechanics resistance conductance compliance they are relatively altered not not altered okay so so uh, all this leads the pregnant woman a very susceptible patient or person for the hypoxic uh, insert and this is the basically the anatomical changes and this is basically the physiological changes the most important point here in the physiological changes something is called as physiological hyperventilation okay so many of the pregnant patient they complain of breathing difficulty or sense of breathing difficulty and sometimes it may be uh, misappropriately perceived as abnormal breathing but most of the times it is a physiological hyperventilation where there is a ventilatory augmentation they try to increase their ventilatory capacity and try to increase their inspiratory uh, capacity to to uh, compensate for the hypoxia so this is called physiological hyperventilation and physiological dyspnea which is very very common in this physiological dyspnea basically start from the first trimester and it goes up to the third trimester most of the cases are because of the hormonal effect because of the progesterone estrogen which levels they go on rising till the third trimester of pregnancy so these two things are absolutely normal so nothing to worry about it but i will like to point out what are the pin point or bullet points which will suggest you that the patient is abnormally breathing or which are the parameters which will suggest you that the this patient is not lit, not uh, physiologically normal that i'll go to the next slide so and if you go to the ergonomics the muscle power the muscle strength absolutely normal there is no change in the ergonomics and there is there is absolutely you can say uh, the muscle strength and expiratory and inspiratory muscle functions are normal if you go to the ventilatory gas sections yes it has been affected to the some extent because of the uh, relatively you know the uh, overall the uh, hemo dilution and because of the increase in the fluid volume there is a airway changes of course which is very important there is a capillary edema there is a upper airway edema there is a uh, of course uh, the nasal congestion is there so all these changes basically it is an adaptation to accommodate hypoxia and to combat hypoxia in a better way for the fetus and the maternal benefit okay so the point of discussion here is the shortness of breath which is very very important so what are the pointer that tells you that yes the breathing of this patient is pathological not physiological because most of the physiological hyperventilation physiological dyspnea that coexists so any dyspnea which is non postural most of the times it suggests what this is a abnormal condition of the for that particular pregnant patient any hyperventilation or any dyspnea which is associated with increase in the respiratory rate the respiratory rate is relatively normal so any patient who comes to me with dyspnea with increased respiratory rate or something called as the tachypnea 
these are the abnormal patients and probably you are dealing with some kind of underlying lung disorder or respiratory problem. Any patient who comes to you with dyspnea with presence of systemic symptoms, any systemic symptom, giddiness, vertigo, dizziness, those are the things where absolutely somebody has to suspect that this is not a normal condition for that particular patient. And of course, hypoxia, which is very, very important. Any pregnant patient who is hypoxic, the saturation less than 92 or 90 percent, always, always it is pathological and one has to be very, very careful about that. And this is a very simple diagram to show that the fetal maternal circulation. So we know that there are uh, there are uh, uterine artery and uterine vein. And uterine artery and uterine vein, this is called the maternal uh, circulation. And uh, the fetal capillaries, there is umbilical, single umbilical artery and umbilical vein. The umbilical artery carries mostly the deoxygenated blood. The um, two um, umbilical veins, they carry the oxygenated blood. And uh, the uh, oxygen extraction from the placenta, which is basically nothing but it is filled up with sinuses and it is a sponge like structure. So the oxygen extraction happens because of the oxygen gradient and the carbon dioxide washed out to the uterine vein because of the carbon dioxide gradient. So if you see the uterine artery, the PO2 is almost looks like a normal PO2 of the systemic circulation. The saturation is normal. Whereas in uterine vein, the PO2 is always on the lower side because of the extraction of the oxygen from the by the fetal capillaries and the saturation is relatively low in the range of 75%. And if you see the umbilical artery here, the umbilical artery, the PO2 is very, very low because they mostly carry the deoxygenated blood and uh, the uterine vein, which is carrying the oxygenated blood, if you see a rise step up of saturation of up to 70% and step up of uh, your PO2 up to 28 millimeter mercury. So if you see the difference between the umbilical vein PO2 and the umbilical artery PO2, the difference is very, very minimal in the range of only 10 millimeter of mercury. Whereas if you see the oxygenation difference between the uterine artery and the uterine vein, it is in the range of 60 millimeter of mercury. So that is where the maternal capillaries or maternal sinuses, the placental sinuses are made up of in such a way that they can carry a lot and lot of oxygen, which they can give to the uh, fetal capillaries. And uh, but the fetal capillaries, if you see, the oxygen reserve is very, very low. That is why whenever the oxygen reserve falls to a little bit lower extent, the fetus get hypoxic. That is why the fetus is actually living in a condition of hypoxic environment or the ecosystem is relatively hypoxic. So that always they depend on the oxygen for the survival. And uh, the mean PO2 gradient uh, between the two is between the uterine artery and the uterine vein is 30 millimeter mercury. The diffusion distance is 3.5 micron. These are very important. And of course, the nature has made this fetal hemoglobin in such a way that they can have a strong affinity to bind to the oxygen to extract maximum oxygenation from the mother to supply to the fetus. And we'll go, go and see what are the different uh, physiological, you know, the conditions or the physiological modification which has happened actually in the uteroplacental circulation. And this is very, very important. So in the right side, we see there are two graphs. One is the oxygen dissociation hemoglobin curve for the mother and the fetus and the second graph is basically the uterine blood flow versus the uterine pressure gradient. So if you see the first graph basically this is the uh, the graph which is showing that the oxygen reserve of the fetus is very very low and if the oxygen reserve slightly falls uh, from the slightly normal level to the abnormal level the fetus get hypoxic whereas the mother has the large vast capacity to actually uh, store oxygen and it doesn't allow them the maternal circulation doesn't easily allow the fetus to get hypoxic that is what the uh, crux of this uh, uh, whole graph and on the right in the right side if you see the uterine blood flow is totally dependent on the uterine blood pressure it is a low pressure sun system so the uterine artery don't have a system which is called the autoregulation mechanism so unlike the circulation in other areas like the circulation in the brain the circulation in the heart the circulation in the lung so the uterine placental circulation is not autoregulated. Okay, so that is the reason. Even if there is a slightest fall in the blood pressure, the maternal blood pressure, maternal hypotension, that leads to the immediate uh, uh, the uh, decrease oxygen supply to the fetus. That is why with each maternal contraction, where there is a vasoconstriction of the uterine uh, fetal blood, uh, your blood vessels, the, the fetus get hypoxic. That is why each contraction, the fetus get hypoxic. Uh, for every fall in blood pressure, the fetus get hypoxic. And that is the reason the these episodes are more and more common towards the uh, labor and these are the more common towards the delivery where actually we have to be very, very careful and the, the peak of this hypoxia actually uh, is exaggerated during just before the delivery. And after the delivery, substantially the oxygen requirement falls 
and uh, ultimately uh, that uh, the the, uh, the 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 mother oxygen requirement also falls and that is why most of the times in a desperate situation to save the mother sometimes uh, the this type of uh, decision to uh, expedition of delivery sometimes be taken care okay so this is what this is the physiological adaptation so if you go to the further dissection of the physiology of fetal maternal unit so one is something called as determinant of fetal oxygen delivery as i already told you it depends on the maternal uh, mean arterial pressure so always always we try to keep the maternal mean arterial pressure more than 65 for the better oxygenation of the fetus because it is a low flow low sunt system where the circulation depends on the maternal blood flow there is something called as double bore effect double harden effect and uh, double bore effect is nothing but there are two bore effect like as you know the bore effect is one operated the pulmonary capillary level and the second operated the utero placental circulation level so the oxygen is being taken in the lungs it is get delivered to the fetus this is called the double double bore effect similarly because of the double harden effect the co2 from the fetal circulation is being, being taken care to the maternal circulation and then from the lung the co2 is being washed out to the outside body this is called the double harden effect and of course this is something which is not desirable and this is called the lethal triad of pregnancy which is very very dangerous just like the lethal triad of trauma we have to remember this is called the lethal triad of pregnancy these are the three things one is called the maternal hypoxia second is called maternal hypotension and third is called maternal anemia because if the hemoglobin level in the mother is low ultimately that also get compromised uh, the oxygen supply to the fetus so this lethal triad so always always is a role of intensivist is to avoid this lethal triad avoid maternal hypoxia keep saturation more than 92% or preferably 94% keep po2 more than 75% unlike the normal person where we normally in a hypoxic patient we normally keep po2 around 55 to 60 or 60 but here you have to aim for a higher po2 avoid maternal hypotension like don't allow the blood pressure or particularly the mean arterial pressure to fall less than 65 and also avoid maternal anemia if the the, the hemoglobin level goes less than particularly 9 try to avoid it and because this is one of the determinant of fetal fetal oxygenation delivery so these are the different uh, red flag sign in a hypoxic mother if the po2 is less than 75 if the pco2 is more than 40 mm of mercury because you know in a pregnancy the co2 levels are relatively on the lower side that is why do never ever allow the permissive hypercapnia which is dangerous for both the mother and the fetus never allow the saturation to drop less than 95% preferably and the dangerous level of saturation is 92% don't allow if the mother is having a significant alteration in the body ph that is also another problem okay any signs of pathological dyspnea just before i describe what are the four signs of pathological dyspnea which differentiate from the physiological dyspnea and any maternal hypotension so these are the different uh, you know the lab parameters the very very important ones and remember while dealing with particularly the obstetric patients because they are different from the normal patient so normally the uh, it's a state of compensatory respiratory alkalosis where the carbon dioxide is relatively on the lower side and this is the physiological adaptation unlike the normal uh, non pregnant state and of course the cardiac parameters one should not forget like the heart rate there is a slight increase in the heart rate slight increase in the cardiac output and slight decrease in the systemic vascular resistance okay and there is a slight decrease in the colloid oncotic pressure and if you compare the pulmonary capillary waste pressure or the central venous pressure they don't change that is the reason the fluid guy or the fluid the fluid uh, guided therapy any fluid can be guided as per the pulmonary capillary waste pressure or central venous pressure monitoring there the value remains same like the non pregnant state so now coming back back to our case so this case if you see the patient is restless she is tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 40 per minute she is tachycardic the blood pressure is 160 by 100 there are bilateral crackles hypoxic it is acute onset she is using the accessory muscles of respiration so it is not not at all a physiological hyperventilation or physiological dyspnea probably this is a something abnormal in the chest and we are dealing with a case of hypoxic mother which is probably uh, in a broader term we can classify into ards so ards is nothing but is a acute respiratory distress syndrome due to any insert or any cause so go by the history like uh, from 1967 only the definition of ards has evolved the asbog and petty they have given the definition in 1967 there is almost a 20 years of silence where there is not much work has been done in the field of ards people actually they try to understand what is actually ards and by the time they understand the almost 20 years have gone and inconsistent definition has been published it is actually in 1994 the acc 
has literally published the first consensus definition of ARDS, but there are a lot of loopholes and fallacies. That is why now the definition is out of the book. And what we normally follow is the Berlin definition. And of course, in a pregnant woman, this definition is slightly been modified. This is called the Kigalis modification and Mathai modification and the recent 2023 definition from the ESICM. So this is the golden uh, age of Berlin definition, the landmark year 2012 where actually the studies, a lot of studies has been done on the ARDS and they have come with a consensus definition of ARDS because actually uh, why this definition has evolved because the previous definition, uh, as per the previous definition, we have to put the pulmonary artery catheter to find out whether the origin of the edema is not from the lungs, not from the heart, it is from the lungs. But nowadays with the pulmonary artery catheter going out of the way, so, and it is a very invasive procedure. So, the definition which the Berlin has suggested, they have not taken into account the pulmonary artery catheter. And most of the times what they have observed when they have given oxygen supplementation to a pregnant patient or to any patients, most of them, the oxygen, uh, the requirement has significantly come down and the saturation has dramatically improved. It is only a subset of patients where in spite of giving the oxygen therapy, they are still become hypoxic. So, so since there is no biomarkers, no uh, other uh, particular subjective assessment to uh, decide about the ARDS, so this is basically a totally objective clinical criteria what they devise. So the criteria is fall into four different different factors. They have taken into four different factors. The first one is the timing. So any ARDS is usually happens within one week of a non clinical insert or a new or worsening respiratory symptom. So the 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 total waiting period to level it as ARDS has extended up to one week. And now I'll tell you to the next level where actually the, the extension has further been extended. Now the chest imaging. So there is definitely bilateral chest opacities, but these opacities are not fully explained by effusions, lobar, lung collapse, and nodules. That means there is no other regions of lung opacities which normally encountered in the chest x-ray. If such kind of pictures are there in the x-ray, probably you suspect that you are dealing with a case of ARDS. There is definitely a lung edema, but this edema is not from the cardiac failure. So that is why the lung edema leads to respiratory failure, which is not from the cardiac failure or not from the fluid overload. If the patient has a fluid overload, you have to first correct the fluid overload before leveling this patient as ARDS. That is the crux or gist of the uh, this discussion. So it's basically need an objective assessment. Either you do a 2D echo or you have to do a hemodynamic monitoring and to exclude hydrostatic edema if no risk factor is present. So you have to find out that absolutely this patient is having no cardiac dysfunction and then you are level them as ARDS. Okay. Oxygenation. Yeah, of course. So when they classify the patients, ARDS patient on the base of oxygenation, initially what they do, they give supplemental oxygen. Now they find out that most of the patients, they are actually not following the definition of ARDS. So they have excluded them. But when they give PEEP or when they give supplemental oxygen in the form of NIV and with a minimum PEEP or minimum uh, NIV support, if the oxygenation is still poor, so they are the candidate which should be included in the ARDS. So PO to FR to ratio, if it is between 200 or 300 millimeter of mercury with PEEP of more than 5 centimeter of water, then probably you are dealing with a case of mild ARDS. If the PO to PF ratio is less than 100, between 100 to 200, it is a moderate ARDS. Or if the PF ratio is between 100, less than 100, it is a severe ARDS. So this is the first landmark paper which suggests and categorize the patient based on the PF ratio into mild, moderate and severe category of ARDS. Now, what are the different uh, loopholes? Because Berlin definition has studied a large number of patients, but actually they don't have a very holistic approach. They don't predict the mortality. So it is a very poor predictor of mortality. So there is a poor mortality predictor model. There is a lack of standardization in assessment of hypoxia. Basically, some patients, they significantly improve. Some patients, they don't improve. And some patients, even, even after the uh, your uh, PEEP and NIV, they land up in ventilator. So there is a, not such a standardization in assessment of hypoxemia. The assessment is only based on PF ratio, not in other other things like they have not performed long ultrasound. They have not performed like the uh, other assessment in the area of hypoxia. Exclusion of major significant variables. They have not commented on respiratory system compliance. The bonding definition, they don't have pointed out respiratory system compliance. They don't have pointed out like what has happened to the patient who are on high peak. Sometimes the hypoxia get corrected, whether they should be included on the bonding definition or not. 
there is no classification on basis of radiological severity they have only classified based on the pf ratio that is the single most important factor no consideration of vasopressor if the patient is on norad nor or vasopressin you don't know which area that patient belong whether it is severe moderate or mild category they have not done ct to find out the severity of the hypoxia they have not also categorized patient who are on hfnc because that time probably the hfnc was new and does not came into the market there is etiology independent they have not classified whether if this is the etiology the patient should be considered to be ards so it is etiology independent limited role in early identification in pre ards phase only when the patient is hypoxic with niv you can only level them with ards not before that and not applicable in resource limited setting like most of the places they don't have abg machine even so how they can classify the patient into mild moderate or severe category and then the new changes which has happened and which is the new area which has been evolved this is called the new global definition in acute respiratory distress syndrome basically they have taken into account all these loopholes and fallacies which is there in the berlin definition so this is a newly proposed diagnostic criteria for acute respiratory distress syndrome and they have included all these things like they have included into hfnc they have taken into account the lung ultrasound they have taken into account the lung compliance and they have of course they have made it very simple unlike the berlin definition i have you need an abg to uh, determine the berlin definition they have best they have classified based on the saturation and fib ratio which is very very important so if you see the acc definition absolutely absolute if you see the berlin definition oxygenation is based on pf ratio less than 300 but if you see the modification like kegelian modification the, they have taken into account spo2 and fib ratio because normally we there is a very simple tool most of the icu they monitor spo2 they have calculated the fib2 and we based on that if the spo2 fib ratio is less than 350 This is the patient is ARDS, unlike the PF ratio less than three. The considered to be ARDS up to the insult is up to a period of one to two weeks. So they have further extended the criteria up to two weeks. So unlike the Berlin definition and Kigali modification, the chest radiograph. Berlin has clear cut shown that there is a there should be bilateral opacities to classify the patient as a ARDS patient. The same has hold true for the Kigali modification. But the the Mathe has clearly told that the opacities should be in the two quadrant, either bilateral or unilateral, or you have to do an ultrasound to find whether the opacities are there or not. Origin of edema probably remain the same. the berlin has also said that the the origin of edema should not be from the cardiac origin the respiratory failures should not fully explained by cardiac failure the same holds true for all the three categories of uh, definition the risk factor of course there is just no etiological risk factor has been identified or they have not taken into account any etiological risk factor from berlin but the same has also hold true for all the three classes of modification the p requirement of course berlin has devised that the at least 5 cm of water peep should be given with invasive ventilation or non invasive ventilation in the mild category but kigali has actually totally taken away this peep concept and the uh, mathe has basically uh, said he has basically uh, again classified uh, been told that either peep or cp you can use and the most important thing which is actually a game changer is he has included the hfnc so if the patient should be uh, if the patient should be having uh, a oxygen Uh, uh, oxygen requirement of more than 30 liter per minute on hfnc then probably he is falling into a category of ard so this is the most significant development uh, going forward because before that there is no concept or there is no uh, guidelines uh, like patients who are on hfnc and of course the reason for the pp is pp can markedly affect the hypoxia the reason is same and provided the hfnc and pp they both do the same job so incidence of ards in obstructive patients fortunately very very uncommon so this is a very important point because we see very less number of cases the incidence is very very low particularly 0.1 to 0.2% and uh, the more common in the third trimester compared to the first and second trimester because of the, of course this is uh, like a, a normal phenomenon because the oxygen requirement the metabolic rates the demand for oxygen is more so any patient who is hypoxic mostly they become more hypoxic in the third trimester incidence is very low 1 per 6000 or 1 per 10000 deliveries 25% cases of the respiratory failure at the time of ICU admission and this is basically a data which is 
taken from you can say the hyderabad where it shows that the of all the obstetric patient who comes to the critical care so hypertension is one of the more significant factor which bring them to critical care and respiratory case is only encounter for 14% and lung is the primary insert for any patient obstetric patient who come to the critical care. Now we diagnose this patient is having ARDS. So what is the likely cause in this patient, particularly PIS? So these are the because of PIS he has gone into inflammation, and this is something one of the unique example in particular in pregnancy where they will end up in uh, PIS. And these are the very important other uh, specific conditions, particularly pertaining to pregnancy, like preeclampsia, preeclampsia with pulmonary edema, and very very important is amniotic fluid embolism. So during delivery, if you find uh, the patient become hypoxic. Land up in oxygen support ventilator. Probably this is an amniotic fluid embolism, which is very very rare. But of course, it is it is not uh, uh, it is it is uh, not I mean, it is most of the times it is encountered in the clinical practice. So third thing is like tocolytics associated pulmonary edema. So most of the tocolytics because of the vasodilatation and because of the cardio uh, cardiac effect, the, they prone the patient for the pulmonary edema. So Depending on the topolytics dose, sometimes this patient can go into plus pulmonary edema and uh, subsequently they land up in ARDS and something something called as uh, uh, pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction. ARDS in gestational trophoblastic disease like chorioamnitis and placental abruption. ARDS due to trophoblastic embolism. ARDS due to peripartum cardiomyopathy. So these are not very uncommon things and uh, the obstetrician as well as the intensivist have in their mind, back up all these clinical conditions while they are dealing with the patient of hypoxic mother. There are other certain conditions where it predisposes the patient to ARDS, but they are not per se because of the pregnancy or not per se because of the pregnancy specific. And this is the condition which is the risk increased by the pregnancy like gastric acid aspiration, venous thromboembolism, bronchial asthma, ARDS, in sepsis, particularly the pyelonephritis. So many of the pregnant patients, they are very prone for pyelonephritis. So uh, we have many of the obstetrician in, this in this forum, so we can take their opinion in this regarding. The trolley, which is very, very important after transfusion. Okay, so air embolism, pneumonia, like particularly the varicella pneumonia, fungal pneumonia, and any valvular heart disease. So the risk is increased in pregnancy. Any pre-existing pulmonary hypertension, if they become pregnant, they can very high chances of going into ARDS. There are other non-specific other ARDS causes, which is same. The causes are same like in other general population, like trauma, drugs, toxins, pancreatitis, systemic sepsis. So all these things are not particularly very particular to the pregnant population, but they are like the you know, cause for other ARDS. Pathophysiology, three phases, very important. Roughly every phase is one week, total three weeks. So the lungs to get healed is takes time to three weeks. No need to go into the detail because you know it is an inflammatory state. So there is a lung insult, there is an insult to the capillary endothelium, epithelium, pulmonary vasculature, and there are a lot of inflammatory mediators who get released. So like the injury to other part of the body, the same lung has also suffered in case of ARDS because of the insult. So the first phase is called the inflammation and exudative. Inflammation phase, it persists for almost for a period of one to two weeks. Mostly the lung become edematous, it becomes heavy. Second thing is there is a proliferative phase. Once the inflammation and edema subsides, the another phase comes, which is called the proliferative phase, also lasts for one week. And ultimately the lung heal by fibrosis, which also takes one week. So the healing of different persons take different time period. The different phases also, depending on the different uh, patient population, it takes different time periods. So it is not a unique rule. It is not a generalized rule. That, that is why ARDS is called the heterogeneous disease. Every patient, the ARDS force is different and every patient the, uh, which they suffer from ARDS, the outcome is different and it is the individualized approach. And of course, this is something called as the two-part unifying theory. So the two theories have been postulated. So one is called the microthrombosis. Second is called the fibrinogenesis. So whatever the insult, so whether it is a trauma, surgery, or transplant, the drug, toxins, there is endothelial injury, there is inflammation pathway activation, and there is a microthrombi pathway activation. This is called two-path unifying theory, which is a very, very recent concept. And there is a cytokine storm, and that leads to fever and inflammation. And this microthrombotic pathway, basically, they are, nowadays they have say they have mostly found out that it is the uh, deficiency of adamptase S3, which is typically found in a case of uh, your one-wheel brain disease. 
the same deficiency has happened and that leads to activation of platelet and wall will bend factor and large, large amount of microthrombi are being formed inside the capillaries of lungs and that leads to disseminated intravascular thrombosis. This is called DIT. So, disseminated intravascular thrombosis and ultimately that leads to something called as microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So, most of the cases of ARDS in pregnancy, you find the platelets are on the lower side because of all this thrombotic process. So, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, TTP-like syndrome and multi-organ hypoxia, ARDS and multi-organ failure. So, this is one theory and second theory is like endothelial dysfunction due to complement activation that leads to endotheliopathy, microthrombi pathway activation that leads to microthrombi in all the organs, all the capillaries of all the organs, brain, lungs, heart, liver, pancreas, adrenals, your muscles. So, this is not a single system disease. That is, ARDS is not limited to the lungs. They say it is a multi-organ syndrome or particularly this is called a bio-organ syndrome. So, bio-organ syndrome, particularly lungs, heart and other tissues. So, I have just discussed with the classical ARDS which we have found. So, there are a lot of atypical non-classical ARDS which we have encountered in non-COVID uh, era. And actually COVID has taught us like regarding the variety of presentation for the non-COVID ARDS. So inflammatory, thrombotic and uh, like something called as the uh, different different phenotypes are also evolved. So the ultimate result is hypoxia. The cause of hypoxia is alveolar damage, capillary damage, leakage, inflammatory cellular infiltrates, VQ mismatch, atelectasis, decreased thoracic compliance, increased dead space ventilation and hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So, ultimately, it is a respiratory failure. The respiratory failure is because of the hypoxia and altered respiratory mechanics, atelectasis, reduced lung compliance, increased dead space. Cardiac failure is because of the right ventricular failure, increased pulmonary artery pressure. This is a very important paper which says that right ventricular failure in acute respiratory distress syndrome, it is very, very common. This is the, the, the author is from, from belongs to the India, actually, Abhishek Biswas, his uh, Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine, this has been published. And this graph is called the Wittenberger graph, which shows that in a normal lung volume, your pulmonary vascular resistance remain normal, remain constant. If there is a atelectasis or lung collapse, the PVR increases. If there is a over distension also, there is an increase in the PVR. And because of this pul from pulmonary vas increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, it gives a load on the right ventricle and ultimately the right ventricle support. So now the concept is moving from lung protective to diaphragm protective ventilation to actually called right ventricular protective strategy for the ventilation. This is the different pattern of lung involvement in ARDS. You can see the normal lung, how it looks like the ARDS lung. This is the histology. You can find this is a normal lung histology and in ARDS you find variety of bullet, your variety of bullet gaps and uh, you can see the lot of micro hemorrhages, micro thrombi and this is what the lung look like in the uh, this thing presentation. Approach to clinical diagnosis, clinical presentation, very important, high index of suspicion, diagnostic test like laboratory, radiology, and most, most important thing is like uh, Dr. Toraskar sir is here, like the lung ultrasound scan is now gaining more and more popularity to diagnose the different kind of ARDS. Chest radiograph, I will show you. There is a X-ray in the early ARDS, you will find there is a homogeneous pulmonary infiltrate, non-central in distribution with a normal cardiothoracic ratio. If this is a non, it is a particularly central in distribution, particularly this is not an idea. This is a most of the times. And if it is a heterogeneous in distribution, some in the apical, some in the vessel, particularly that also is mostly we are not dealing with a case of ideas. But of course, there are different variety of presentation is there, like you can have lower presentation in most of the cases, 36%, diffuse presentation is 23%, 23%, patchy infiltration in also in 41%. So most common presentation is the patchy presentation, particularly in the COVID ARDS, you can find variety of long picture in the X-ray. So these are the two diagrams which shows that importance of the lung ultrasound. So, you can see this is a normal protocol and in particular in the ARDS, what is important in lung ultrasound, you will find the subpleural consolidations, thick and irregular pleural line, which is differentiated from the pulmonary edema. So, normally in pulmonary edema, the pleural lines are continuous, it is not thickened and it is regular. Whereas here it is regular, thickened, non-continuous and particularly the most of the times you find the consolidations are located to the subpleural area, particularly in COVID ARDS. B lines, which is non-uniform in distribution, unlike your pulmonary edema, which is uniform in distribution. And there can be sometimes you find there are spared areas where there is absolutely the lung ultrasound is normal. If you screen the heart, you will find there is a changes of acute or pulmonary in severe ARDS. 
Okay. Particularly, you can find the distended IVC, mild pulmonary to moderate pulmonary hypertension, functional tricuspid regurgitation, and of course, this kinetic septum, which is which is very very pathognomonic of this kind of ADS lung. Then CT scan finding, so you can find three types of alveoli, which is called normal alveoli, injured alveoli, and damaged alveoli. We'll go how these two things look like. Already have discussed like thoracic ultrasound and cardiac ultrasound, how the things are. And there are two important concepts in ADS, something called as the baby lung and something called as the sponge lung. So what is the baby lung basically? So baby lung is nothing, but it is the, actually the normal lung, which is physiologically being aerated in, with oxygen if a patient has suffered from ARDS. So actually this, this is called the baby lung, which actually the normal lung parenchyma and this, all the oxygen exchange, the carbon dioxide exchange happened in this normal part of the lung. And this is, you can see the size of the baby lung is very, very small, but there are other parts of the lung which actually don't take part in the oxygenation. And this is called the non erected lung or poorly erected lung. Okay. So these are called the damage. And out in the baby lung also, you can find variety of your uh, alveoli. Something called as the first filling alveoli and something called as the slow filling alveoli. So basically the baby lung volume is a function of ARDS severity. If you find a smaller baby lung in CT scan, particularly the ARDS is more severe. Severe ARDS baby lung may be 20 to 30 percent of the normal lung volume. Small baby lung exposed to 100 percent of the mechanical force of mechanical ventilation and participating 100 percent of the gas action. So I will tell you there, is, there are two types of alveoli in the baby lung. So all these baby lungs are called unstable alveoli. So unstable alveoli have two types of alveoli. One is called the first alveoli and second is called the slow alveoli. So what is the first alveoli? So first alveoli is that they easily get distended at the end of the expiration and they collapse rapidly at the end of the expiration. So they are the alveoli which get rapidly inflated, rapidly collapse. And they get repeated opening and closing. And because of the sheer stress, they cause lung damage. Whereas the slow alveoli, they feel very fast. There is a partial filling at the end of the inspiration and partial emptying at the end of the expiration. So basically the slow alveoli, they don't get full inspiration or they don't uh, like they don't get collapse or they don't get absolutely uh, uh, the, the, the air which is there inside. They don't get empty. So that is the reason. So the partial recruitment. So that, that is the reason the slow alveoli. You have you require more peep to open them. Okay. Whereas in the for the first alveoli, you need to have an ideal peep to keep them open and get them ventilated. So that is the two important concept. And this is something called as the end expiratory uh, your uh, CT scan finding in supine and prone. And this is a very important concept because baby lung is not a physiological, it is a physiological entity. It is not an anatomical entity. Now you see in supine position, my baby lung is here, but actually when the same patient gets prone, you can see the capacity of the baby lung is totally changed. Now this baby lung, which is here, actually now you can find that this area is not actually the baby lung, now the dorsal part, which is now being taken care of as a baby lung and they are participating in the gas action. So, so depending on the physiology, depending on the position, the size of the baby lung, they, they get expanded and they get collapsed. And our aim is to get more and more baby lung inside a normal ARDS lung so that oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal will happen in a much, much better way. And our aim is to keep the first alveoli remain open with the pit and not get collapsed suddenly after the expiration. Whereas our aim is to keep the slow alveoli open and also make them completely empty at the end of the expiration. This is what is the total concept. And this is something called as this sponge model. Basically, when you uh, make the lung supine, without the ARDS, you can find there is a homogeneous appearance of all the alveoli. But when actually you, there is a ARDS because of the lung edema and because of the gravity, you can find the alveoli in the ventral part because of the effect of the gravity, they become collapsed. So this is why there is an uneven distribution of the size of the alveoli from the top to the bottom or from the sternum to the spine. And this is called because of the interstitial edema, increased mass, and there is a collapse of the alveoli. This is something called as the sponge model. So our aim is to prevent the sponge model by giving repeated prone and supine position so that there is a better exchange of the air and better exchange of the oxygen levels. So after understanding this concept, so if you come back to our own case, basically now this patient is Definitely hypoxic using accessory muscle of respiration. She is tachycardic. She requires any cell stabilization. So how do we stabilize? Particularly now the lot of literature has been evolved. In a case of mild ARDS, you can go with HFNC, high-frequency nasal cannula, or you can go with NIV. So particularly if the 
what are the different criteria i will tell you like uh, niv is can be only applied if the patient is having mild to moderate ids conscious cooperative hemodynamic stable good respiratory drive effective secretion clearance and probably for a short term okay but most important thing whenever you put the pregnant patient in niv always always give good acid pro acid prophylaxis they have high chances of aspiration make them in propped up position and slightly on the lateral position because of the to prevent this uterocaval uh, blood flow to get maintained because of the superior uh, because of the supine hypotension so a lot of trials have also proved that this niv is beneficial ards net trial probably trial yes ism guidelines society's guideline expert consensus and what i want to tell all of you like monitoring of the rox index which is very very important when the patient is on hfnc and hackers criteria should be followed when the patient is on ni so niv is always always a double edged sword there is a very high chances like particularly in the covid where the lungs are more and more stiff there is high chances of getting self inflicted lung injury i'll tell you what is the basis of self inflicted lung injury there is a chances of barotrauma trauma aspiration hypotension pressure ulcer delayed intubation very very important but one thing is sure, sure that sometimes they may pre- they may cure the hypoxia the patient may not need intubation because you know pregnant pregnancy is a case of difficult intubation sometimes the airway complications are more than that of intubating the patient but of course if they need intubation you have to intubate them but mild ards sometimes the intubation can be uh, prevented and the patient can sometimes get better in most of the cases we have managed with niv also and for 3 days 4 days with uh, you know the uh, left lateral position with proning with away proning is now getting more and more popularity so this is basically an away proning so applying niv and getting away proning is difficult for the pregnant patient in the third trimester to make them prone but of course you need a good team which will help and sort out these issues okay so coming back to our case basically so initial stabilization has been done with niv still the patient is desaturating fi to 100% she is getting drowsy and of course she is requiring mechanical ventilator before going into mechanical ventilator i want all the my students and fellows to understand the different aspect of the mechanical ventilator something called as the intraalveolar pressure or intrapleural pressure and something called as the transpulmonary pressure always remember the intrapleural pressure is negative the transpulmonary pressure is positive either it is zero or it is positive more positive is the transpulmonary pressure so transpulmonary pressure is nothing but it is the difference between intraalveolar pressure which is negative minus the intrapleural pressure which is also again become negative because unless until it is become negative you cannot breathe and you cannot take oxygen so that is the reason overall the net result is transpulmonary pressure is positive so but the more positive the transpulmonary pressure more is the stress or more is the something called as the your uh, strain on the lung i'll go to that stress index so that is the reason the transpulmonary pressure should be kept minimum and the intraalveolar pressure also should be also not should not be very high to cause the lung damage so most of the times when the patient breathes spontaneously she tries to take more and more oxygen to compensate for the hypoxia that leads to vigorous increase in the transpulmonary pressure and that leads to the lung damage and this is something called as the self inflicted lung injury particularly in a patient who is spontaneously breathing so the crux of the story is ventilation is not a cure not at all a cure it only to give the time to buy time for the lung to get better and only ventilation strategy has shown to reduce the mortality from 40% and to mortality has bring down to 31% that is why the intensivist has to differentiate between good ventilation versus bad ventilation if you ventilate them well they will recover they will the lung will get time to recover if you ventilate them bad it is more disastrous in fact you are creating more harm that is the reason you have to understand this mechanics like you have to understand the compliance the resistance the stress factor the strain factor of ventilation the mechanical power and these are the this is the paper which suggests that very important paper understanding pulmonary stress strain relationship in severe ids and its implication for designing a safer approach to setting of the ventilator and if you see in a case of ids normally if you see in a normal lung if you could get ventilate so this is the ct scan and uh, if you see that the normal lung it falls into this region and the ids lung falls into this this region like non aerated mostly in the non aerated zone and the normal lung falls into the most aerated zone and this is the normally aerated disease lung with a static compliance very very important you see that there is a linear relationship of compliance with the aeration of the lung so if your compliance is 10 probably only your 10% of the lung is working probably you have a baby lung which is 10% of the volume if your compliance is 20 your baby lung is 20% of your lung is only working if your compliance is 30 your 30% of your baby lung is only your lung, normal lung is working or your volume of the baby lung is 30% 
this is a very famous paper from the Gattinoni actually. He has proved this, and this is something called as the gas volume and compliance. And you see, and you clear cut sees that as the compliance increases, the gas volume in the lung increases, better oxygenation. If the compliance goes down, the gas volume or the oxygenation, gas exchange, all of them get compromised. That is why the reason I am pointing out here is that your aim is to ventilate the lung with a very good compliance and make them compliant so that your oxygenation and everything become better. But of course, bad ventilation has all its side effects like ventilator induced lung injury, the self-inflicted lung injury in ventilator. So one is the self-inflicted lung injury in NIV and this is the self-inflicted lung injury on ventilator. Volume trauma, barotrauma, atelectric trauma, biotrauma and now the recent concept is orgotrauma or muscle trauma, diaphragm trauma. And I just add another trauma to the pregnant patient like intubation trauma. So these four things you have to avoid. Now you can, now you can, now you can see in this, in this diagram that how the bad ventilation has triggered the bad pathway and uh, biotrauma and that leads to the more and more lung injury. So this is a simple slide which says that the clinical equivalents like stress index and strain index. So stress index is nothing but actually it is the force which is being given to the respiratory system and how the respiratory system is able to handle that stress. This is called the stress on the respiratory system which is measured by the transpulmonary pressure. So if your transpulmonary pressure is more, probably the stress on the lungs are more. What is called as a strain? The strain is nothing but if you subject the lung to stress factor like more transpulmonary pressure, how the shape or volume of the lung get altered, whether the lung is being altered in a normal way or the lung find it's difficult to get altered to that or difficult it to the lung find it difficult to handle that stress. This is called the strain. So strain is measured by the tidal volume by functional residual capacity. And if you see the pleural pressure or transpulmonary pressure, which is nothing but some constant into the strain factor. So the more is the strain factor, more is the stress factor more is the transpulmonary pressure, more is the strain factor. So this is a vicious cycle. That is why the ARDS lung is actually small, but it is actually not the stiff lung. Because if you see the normal lung, you can find the compliance, the strain factor is 0.2. But in ARDS lung, you find the strain factor is almost in the range of one. Because here, actually, instead of 2,500 FRC, you are only delivering or only getting FRC of 500 ml. So the aim is to avoid the strain as much as possible to keep the strain very minimal in the range of 0.5 to 0.6. If it is cross more than one, probably your lungs are in a dynamic zone where they are so they can be severe damage to that particular lung. That is where the lung protective ventilation strategy is going to not only lung protective to diaphragm protective and to the right ventricular protective ventilation strategy. So the minimizing baby lung stress and strain and optimizing the diaphragm effort and synchrony. And that is where the lower tidal volume helps to prevent the ventilator-induced lung injury and muscle relaxant and sedation. They help to prevent the self-inflicted lung injury. Because if the patient is breathing spontaneously, then probably he or she may develop the self-inflicted lung injury. So this diagram is showing that if the FRC of a normal patient is here, where the is here, and the FRC is like uh, three times the the maximum total lung capacity is three times the normal FRC and this is the upper bottom line. So your aim is to ventilate the lung below this point because this is the more dangerous point. This is the If the ventilation is crossing below this point, probably lung has a higher chances of damage. Okay. So that is the reason in case of ARDS, what, what happens? Basically, even if you keep the FRC and everything in the normal range, but you, if you see because of the peak, the effect or the shifting of this uh, area from here to here happened and what the patient is breathing normally in this area now he has to breathe against the peep and now most of the times he is going into this dangerous zone of touching the total lung capacity beyond which the lung cannot expand so that is the reason keep the tidal volume low keep the plateau pressure low so that there is a limited scope of expansion so that is where the reason of arms are volume trauma and atelectric trauma so basically the volume trauma leads to a generalized trauma because of the lung inflammation edema. The atelectric trauma because of the lung collapse, it is a focal area of lung collapse. I showed you the spawn model. So mostly the collapse happened in the basis or in the ventral person in a supine patient. Okay. And when the patient is in the prone position, it happens in the, the uh, atelectric trauma or the collapse trauma happens in the, again, in the supine, your uh, basal position or the anterior part. So this is the two sim simple important concept. And now the next concept I already told you like the driving pressure and the transpulmonary pressure. 
So the driving pressure is nothing, but actually it is the difference between your plateau pressure and peak. Why I'll tell you why driving pressure are important because the monitoring of driving pressure is very, very important and the keep the driving pressure less than 14 uh, for prevailing from the mortality. This is one of the mortality indicator. Okay. And if the driving pressure are going very high, probably in that cases you need a monitoring with the transponary pressure because driving pressure mostly monitor the pressure inside the airway, whereas the transponary pressure measure the compliance of the lung as well as the chest wall. And the final part of the ventilation is the, like the mechanical part, where even if this is a very simple experiment or study, which shows that <clears throat> there are a lot of patients who get ventilated with same mechanical power, but they have different tidal volume, different respiratory rate, and different vital capacity. But if you see, ultimately, the, the injury to all these three lungs are same. So this clear cut shows that even if you alter the pressure, alter the volume, alter the respiratory rate, alter the PIP, it is ultimately the mechanical power or the load which is given to the respiratory system by the ventilator, which determine actually the bio biotone. Okay. <clears throat> that is why the monitoring the mechanical power is very, very important. Now, I am not going to detail into the COVID ARDS because COVID ARDS is more complex, more heterogeneous, and actually they don't follow a proper protocol and rules, whatever thing I told you for a non-COVID ARDS or classical ARDS. So I'll restrict my discussion to the classical ARDS. So the core knowledge concept. Personalized ventilation strategy with precise some medicine, target on safe ventilation. So one has to remember that there is no safe ventilation strategy. We have to make the ventilation safe. There is no such strategy. The strategy depends on the intensivist, particular treating physician. Ventilation has to be tailored to individual patient. <clears throat> it has to tailor to the hemodynamics, gas exchange, lung reputability, respiratory mechanics. And there are different trials which actually being performed, taking into account the target volume, ventilation, recruitment strategy ventilation, airway driving pressure ventilation, plateau pressure ventilation, transformative pressure ventilation, stress and strength index ventilation, and now the recent concept of ventilating with lung imaging, like ventilating the patient with doing repeated CT scan, ultrasound, electrical impedance tomography scan, where you can see the different areas where which are getting ventilated. Okay, these are the different studies. <clears throat> and of course, you have a lot many things like you have different modes, different ventilators, which will help you out. So as a general rule, ventilate them with 4 to 6 ml per kg tidal volume. Keep the plateau pressure less than 27. Rule number 3 is keep the driving pressure less than 15. Rule number 4, keep the RR less than 30. Rule number 5, keep the PEEP less than 15. Consider personalized PEEP if the PEEP is going more than 15. Rule 6, keep mechanical power less than 70 joule per minute. Consider ECMO or ECHO if the mechanical power is going very high. So it is not the hypoxia. It is actually the mechanical power which determines whether the patient will go into the ECMO or prone or anything. Prone position, if the PF ratio is less than 150, neuromuscular broker to prevent PC leak and in severe ideas when appropriate. Recruitment maneuvers we don't practice, not routinely recommended, consider rescue ECMO. So these are the different important points. What should be your target PO2, target PCO2, what are the different general rules, no permissive hypercapnia. The guidelines of ARDS network study remain the same for pregnant and non-pregnant ARDS. Fitness and placenta increase resting oxygen consumption by 20%. So these are the different rules what I have pointed out here. And uh, coming back to our case, now she's being put on ventilator. Now ventilating with lung protective ventilation strategy with ARDS net protocol. After eight hours, again, this patient getting desaturated. So what do you do basically? So the refractory hypoxia and supra refractory hypoxia, the options are proning, early and extended, Neuromuscular broker, there is a warning, not recommended, ECMO and ECHO to decrease the respiratory load, lot of experimental therapy. Very important concept, early proning, extended proning always, always helps. Always it is a savior. You have to use it when the patient is hypoxic. It is not absolute contraindication. Many physicians say it is a relative contraindication. With the best center, best expertise, you can make them prone. You can improve their oxygenation. You can decrease their compliance. And uh, this is the mechanism of whole you know, prone position. Neuromuscular blocker, of course, previously 2004 accuracy trial says that there is a mortality benefit, but be careful about benzodiazepines, digipam. They are, called, they are usually cause fetal defect in first trimester. Propofol is not a good agent. Dexmeditomidin is not a good agent. You have to use fentanyl, which is safe, morphine, or depolarizing muscle relax. ECMO, yes, there is a role of ECMO in case of refractory hypoxemia. These are the different studies. These are the different recommendations. 
and these are the different allied interventions for ads like conservative fluid strategy make them negative don't overload them okay and these are the re different recent drugs like abiptadine which is now still in the experimental phase and these are the different guidelines for steroid therapy they don't have mortality benefit now they are almost out of the literature initially they came in 2004 second study in 2010 now coming back to coming back to our case so now this patient is being ventilated getting desaturated intermittently and she has have almost four weeks of prolonged icu stay tracheostomy done these are the different ICU course, which may be complicated by multiple wave of infection, critical illness, neuromyopathy, severe lung fibrosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, spontaneous multiple time pneumothorax, ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, pressure ulcers. The fetal monitoring is a challenge. Hypoxic fetus always leads to low birth weight, IUGR, preterm delivery, perinatal mortality, and morbidity. The recommendation is keep maternal PO2 more than 75, fetal PSO2 less than 65. Avoid persistent alkalosis and monitoring is daily fetal heart rate monitoring. Weekly umbilical artery doppler should be there. Every 15 days, do an ultrasound to monitor the fetal growth. Amniocentesis, wherever feasible, near the term to assess the fetal maturity. XA chest, normally we are afraid of, but if you think that it is helpful sometimes to identify the pneumothorax, to borrow trauma, you can go for XA chest in the pregnancy. The exposure is not very high, in the range of 60 milliliter to exposure. Normally, it has been found that if the radiation exposure goes more than 0.5 GUI, then it is dangerous. But here it is only 60 milliliter. In fact, CT scan also is sometimes not producing this kind of radiation exposure, but we don't routinely perform CT or don't routinely suggest also. First and second trimester, try to avoid user shield to prevent the teratogenesis. So, ventilator, ECMO, these are nothing but these are the bridge to recovery, bridge to bridge, bridge to therapy. And you can do prone, and ultimately, if the patient don't recover, you can consider for transplant. There are a lot of centers in India which are doing transplant. Ethical issues, brain death, end of life care, sometimes can be there. Delivery, it should be a multidisciplinary approach. It should only be undertaken to reduce the maternal consumption of oxygen by 28 percent within 24 hours. That is why, if you see that to save the mother, if it is required, definitely it is required. So it is in the maternal interest, not the fetal interest. Prolonged ventilation. Up to 100 days with successful delivery of viable fetus is also reported. So, okay, that is the reason. So, this patient may sometimes get prolonged ventilator, prolonged ECMO support, prolonged ICU stay, and preservation of the uterine placental blood flow is the key principle. Organ donors donation is also possible. And these are different centers' experience. Ultimately, patients who don't recover from ECMO, they have done lung transplant, pregnancy lung transplant. Of course, few centers like Kim's, they have tried. And I can say in my concluding slide that ARDS is an enigma because you can see the number of trials which have been performed. The ARMA trial, late 1992, 2000, ARDS network trial, alveoli trial, PEEP trial, PAC trial, accuracy trial, 2004, seizure trial, 2009, ROSE trial, 2010, ARDS network trial, some steroids, 2006, 2011, ALTA trial, ADEN trial, SALT, SALT trial, PROSEVA trial, PROCESS SOFT trial, EOLIA trial, CANULA trial, PART trial, and VEN trial, like OSCAR and OSLEP. Okay, so much of literature, so much of trial studies, but still it is still a mystery and still it is an, I can say it is an enigma. These are different gadgets which you can use, NIV, HFNC, ventilator, nitric oxide, no benefit, but people have used ECMO, methylene blue, ECOR, CRRT, extracorporeal therapy, because it is a multi-organ dysfunction. Patient can have kidney injury, liver injury, DIC, coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, repeated bronchoscopy may be required. Home oxygen therapy, sometimes the patient can be discharged on home oxygen therapy with antifibrotic drugs. Fibrosis is very, very particularly common in COVID ARDS. Ventilation strategy, prone ventilation, very, very helpful. Liquid ventilation, not practice, out of the dead. High frequency oscillation, not practice. So benefit in pediatrics. So with this, uh, I would like to end the talk and uh, I, uh, let's, I request the panel uh, panelists to take up the questions and... Uh, Let's. Uh, uh, I would like to stop here for my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Gunadhar, for this uh, very lucid. And I would, I must say, very exhaustive as well. And you have tried to cover almost all the important points of ARDS, and still it is mysterious. You have rightly pointed out important points in physiological changes that are associated with the pregnancy pertaining to the. Say altered chest wall compliance and the lung reserves, which are which are altered 
and then the uterine flow which is also you know not auto regulated we need to take care of that as well and then how the ARDS definition has changed over a period of time from Berlin to Kigali to now Mathai's modification and uh, various pa various aspects which were missing in the previous definition they have tried to incorporate with the newer definitions and there are still lacunas as far as the definition of ARDS is concerned. We have also discussed the differential diagnosis uh, pertaining to the pregnancy, amniotic fluid embolism and tocolytic uses and the other, you know, uh, complications that can also mimic like ARDS in pregnant patients. And uh, we have also tried to understand how the lung is inhomogeneous in ARDS patient and the baby lung concept has also been discussed. And we have also tried to assess uh, the different strategies to uh, uh, help this patient as far as hypoxia is concerned, right from non-invasive ventilation, which is associated with uh, self-inflicted injury if it is prolonged and if it is not monitored to ventilate a support with, uh, you know, hardness strategy and the prevention of ventilator-induced lung injury is also so much important. And while ventilating these patients, we need to monitor different uh, factors like, you know, plateau pressure, driving pressure, stress index, we need to monitor this also. So now we have to change our focus from lung protective ventilation strategy. And we have to also incorporate diaphragmatic protective ventilation strategy also. Because ventilator itself is very injurious if it is not used judiciously. And there is no uh, safe ventilation strategy. It is the individualized approach that we have to offer to the patient. And we do not do harm. Okay, our intention should be to continue and bridge uh, ventilator support with the ventilator support and buy some time till their lung recover. And then we also have to uh, know, we'll consider monitoring fetal circulation while the patient is in, uh, you know, ARDS with ventilation and recruitment maneuver is not very useful. And we have to adopt, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, you know, ideas to uh, ECMO to ACOR and the prone ventilation strategies can also be difficult in prone position, but nevertheless, it's not that difficult. If we have a proper, you know, uh, you know, in infrastructure and we take care of the fetus and uh, increased uterus, we, which is protected from all around, even prone positioning can also be done in these patients. And we have seen a lot, lot of trials which are helpful. You know, we all have to go through these trials and understand ARDS. I think there is a lot to, again, uh, uh, discover and rediscover as far as ARDS is concerned, right? From pathophysiology to different uh, drugs that are you now available. And then ventilation strategy is also still evolving. We are still not able to find out what is the best ventilation strategy on all that. With this, I would like to request uh, the moderators also and... Uh, uh, if we have a few questions, we would like to take a few questions. Uh, if our moderators also would like to add a few important, uh, you know, points that they would like to uh, add. I mean, right from Dr. Kedar Toraskar, if you can highlight a few important points. Yeah, so uh, very excellent, exhaustive lecture, Gunagar. So, to provide most of the points. So, uh, my quarter is focus, so I will uh, like to add something on focus. So you had a couple of slides. So uh, the first thing in uh, pregnancy related ARDS is uh, imaging. So you said that X-ray can be done, yes, but it is again giving some radiation. So X-rays need not be repeated every day like in a non-pregnant patients here. So you can use the lung, lung ultrasound to uh, good uh, use. And here the first thing is to first thing is to differentiate cardiogenic edema versus non-cardiogenic edema. So there. You can see the heart, lung, cardiac ultrasound, IVC ultrasound. And uh, you have these homogeneous B lines in, in cardiogenic pulmonary uh, edema. Whereas, uh, uh, and the uh, heart is also, you may have a diastolic dysfunction if the systolic function is big out, or you may have a systolic dysfunction or valvular heart disease. So the etiology, the cardiac etiology can also be determined by the echocardiography. So, Whereas in non-cardiogenic edema, that is ARDS, you have B lines which are uh, which which are inhomogeneous. Okay, then you have break in the pleura, and the pleura is not continuous. You may have subpleural consolidation, as we classically see in COVID ARDS. And uh, there, 
one more thing is only V prime pro profile that is the break in the pleura may not be may not be enough. So you have to see the cardiac ultrasound also and uh, rule out the cardiogenic element there. And it also helps in recruitment. Though recruitment is not being used very frequently, but there is a subset of patients in whom recruitment may be helpful. Or optimizing PEEP. So you need to know the best PEEP. So we have something called as aeration deaeration score. So we have certain scores, okay, lung ultrasound scores, in which you increase the PEEP and see what is the optimal PEEP. So you start with a uh, with a bad lung, that is score of three, and you have you have a total score of 36 for both the lungs and this is how you how you monitor the aeration deaeration after the recruitment or after increasing the peak you see what are the differences in the aeration and the deaeration score so that's that's one utility uh, thing in lung ultrasound one more thing which you rightly mentioned is rv protective ventilation so in rv protective ventilation around 15 to 20 percent of the patients with ARDS have this subset of right ventricular dysfunction and acute core pulmonary secondary to the ARDS itself, okay, because of it is associated with it. And here, the PEEP is detrimental. So in this, these subset of patients, you may not give high PEEP and you have to differentiate these subset of patients from the from those patients who don't have RV dysfunction. So that's one more addition to the use of focus in, in pregnancy with the ARDS. And of course, if there is no radiation at all. So whenever you feel that, okay, fine, this patient is not doing well, you repeat the ultrasound whenever you want. So generally, we repeat the focus. So these are advantages of using the focus at the bedside, especially in pregnancy, which becomes one classical indication because you can't use, you can't have x-rays daily. You can't shift the patient down to the CT scanner because the patient is unstable in the area. So Lung ultrasound, the, the focus protocol in ERDS goes a long way. And of course, we have discussed diaphragmatic ultrasound. I don't want to rediscuss that because we have different discussed diaphragm. So diaphragm protective ventilation is also coming up in a big loop. RV protective ventilation, diaphragm protective ventilation, differentiating cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, looking at the LA pressure. So the Berlin definition uh, said that, okay, you look at the, you, you don't use the swan or with the swan, has become uh, almost obsolete in, apart from few indications, but we are we no longer use the swan because of the focus. So these are the we use E by E prime, which is a good reflector of the LA pressure. So if your E by E prime is more than 14, uh, that means there is a diastolic dysfunction. And a rough formula is E by E prime plus four, that is the LA pressure. So if your LA pressure is high, it is cardiogenic edema, and if obviously your heart is not good, you have a valvular pathology or you have you have a poor systolic function, a cardiomyopathy, you can see it there. So these are a few points in focus which are very, very useful. So not only in pregnancy, but in non-pregnant females also, these are useful. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, we have to focus our uh, strategies from lung protective ventilation. Along with that, we have to protect diaphragm and we have to protect the right ventricle also. You know, right ventricle is very much uh, un under, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, identified that injuries to the right ventricle is also very common. There are a few questions. Uh, can I take these questions? Like, uh, uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Sauro. Uh, how do we uh, choose a, a P, uh, low P versus yeah. high P? Yeah. What is your experience okay. on this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, before then, uh, the, I'll take the question. Uh, before coming to the question, uh, yeah. I must congratulate Dr. Gunnar because he has picked up very important topic because we don't because incidence of uh, pregnancy in the is not so high so we don't see much pressure like this and all, as you already mentioned that it does already they they have a higher oxygen demand so in this case ARDS may be quite catastrophic for them and there are many issues like in pregnancy because their air may be difficult. They have a high risk of aspiration also. Um, and, and the uh, effect of PEEP on uh, pregnancy on the fetus and then effect of prone position, how these are like still we, we need some more data for that. Uh, yes, uh, right, right, ventricular, right ventricular dysfunction may happen in the ARDS even if, even if you uh, 
even if you uh, do the lung protective ventilation. Cordyceps, I want to show you that I, I uh, try to do meta analysis. Like, Dr. Gunnar, can you uh, stop your screen share? Yes, I want to see some, show something. Uh, I just want to show one of my paper. It was published, uh, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. coming here. Okay, actually, I did a meta analysis a few years back in, in 2016. And I, I did, I included around eight, nine studies, and my, I, I, I analyzed around 700, 800 patients. And I found that even if you do lung protective ventilation, the incidence of acute core problem is as high as 23%. So, as Dr. Governor already said, there is no safe, safe P plan. Now, coming to the questions whether we should take high PIP or low PIP in ARDS net trial. Uh, I uh, I feel, I think it's uh, it's depend upon the patient to patient. You should now we can titrate PIP according to the compliance. We can titrate PIP according to the driving driving pressure. Though uh, new guidelines, yes uh, yes yeah, yes ISM guidelines according to about ARDS ARDS uh, management, they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't, they didn't recommend particularly any high PIP low PIP or PIP based on compliance. I think. We still we don't we, we need more evidence, but we still go for the adjustment of PIP as per the compliance as per the driving pressure because it will help us to individualize PIPs rather than just following a protocol. Yeah, so uh, uh, with ARDS net, uh, you can uh, try that PIP uh, if I were to charge, get guided if you are not very sure, you are not able mm -hmm. to monitor blood pressure or driving pressure. So you can just get guided by that PIP uh, FIO2 chart where PIP should be 20 times FIO2, something like that. And at the same time, keep monitoring plateau pressures and driving pressures and accept a PIP which is not altering uh, the plateau pressure and not compromising with the driving pressure. And also the stress and strain index also you can calculate with the new advanced uh, ventilators. And then mechanical power also can be calculated if all of these are not altered, what is... Oh. The safe value of PEEP, I mean, you can accept that. But, you know, there is one more question on the recruitment manual as to uh, do we uh, need to do a recruitment manual and is it obsolete or uh, is there any role of recruitment manual? There is one question. And Dr. Sandeep, uh, can I request you to take this question? Yeah, sure. So, first thing is uh, something for Dr. Gunadhar. I think this is one of the best yes. presentations on ARDS that I've heard. And uh, coming to the question on uh, recruitment manual and PEEP, I think this has been, both of these have been um, area of uh, controversies and discussions since long, since last 15 years, I've been hearing all the people talking about it. So uh, right, right now, as the uh, person has already said, that uh, there are no recommendation per se to use long recruitment or short recruitment episodes. So that is clear. So SAI maneuvers are something that we can use to uh, prevent the, uh, to rec uh, recruit the lungs. Second important thing would be to apply adequate peak. Rather than uh, applying something which may harm the patient, let us avoid doing it. Uh, the optimal PEEP is something that we should uh, apply, which will prevent the de-recruitment of lungs also. And uh, I think there have been multiple trials recently which have shown that uh, um, patient-specific PEEP titration versus ARDSnet uh, table, there was no mortality benefit of using higher PEEP. Secondly, for higher PEEP also, there were a subset of patients who have very severe ARDS. Maybe uh, using higher PEEP in those patients is helpful, otherwise it is not. Uh, so yes, there is uh, no recommendation as of now to recruitment venues. Yeah, there's one more question on uh, stress index uh, and the graph. Uh, Rather, some students have requested, can you explain that graph again? Yeah, 
yeah yeah so no basically so uh, so it depend on the shape of the graph basically so you have to identify within the normal graph and the lung alveoli which is under the stress so there are actually uh, if uh, they want i can i can share them for free they can the sort of graphic version of that particular stress index but second is like you can also calculate the stress index like it should not be more than one actually okay like uh, the tidal change in the tidal volume divided by the frc so it should not be uh, exceed more than one it has been found that if the stress index is going more than one probably your the your ventilation is doing more harm than uh, the benefit so graphical representation i have actually yeah so frc calculation is not available with most of the ventilators there are only few ventilators with which you can calculate frc and uh, once you have frc in the tidal volume you can definitely get the stress index which is around uh, 0.5 to 0.6 and if the stress index is more than 0.8 uh, probably this patient has uh, no likelihood of a lung injury and this patient is likely to deteriorate and you may not respond to the ventilation strategies that you have adopted you may have to do certain changes or alteration uh, and you have to come down on plateau pressures and uh, plateau pressures and the driving pressures the stress and strain index can help you to predict that the, uh, there is likelihood of a lung injury so if there is one more question so what, I not, uh, what i am not uh, what i am not actually stressed on the recent uh, artificial intelligence enabled ventilator which is called the uh, intelivent they have different mode like intelivent intellisense intelicuff so they can automatically measure the uh, you know with a uh, transformer pressure by a means of esophageal valves so if you actually suspect there is a uh, your chest wall compliance is very high particularly it's a stiff stiff chest wall and uh, your lung compliance is somewhat divergent from the chest wall compliance if you have those kind of ventilator probably use it and uh, itself they have lot of graphs they can show the lung mechanics they have facility to do a eit and they have facility to put the esophageal to measure the transpulmonary pressure which is actually full or measured in two situations either in the end of the expiration or the end of the inspiration and they can actually tells you that your transpulmonary pressures are going very high and you have to limit your uh, transpulmonary either by reducing the tidal volume or by reducing your plateau pressure or reducing by p or uh, the other something Sometimes you are meant to count the respiratory rate also because now this this mechanical power is a combination of also if somebody is ventilating with high respiratory rate probably that is sometimes can also cause more uh, dangerous to or damage to the lung. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if, do we have any further questions? Uh, if you do, if you don't have any questions, uh, uh, can we conclude the session? We have already exceeded the time half an hour more. Yes, yes. And I must thank you, Dr. Yes. Unadar, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, this presentation will also be available uh, on YouTube channel, Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network channel, and can it will be freely available to everyone. And I must I also thank uh, our moderators, Dr. Kedar, Forrester, Sir, Dr. Uh, Sandeep Agarwal, and Dr. Saurav. Uh, for their presence and valuable inputs on this topic. And I also uh, thank Dr. Gunadar for taking time out. And, uh, you know, you must have put a lot of efforts preparing these PowerPoint and slides, which, uh, which is full of information. And I must thank you for this. I think the uh, audience has definitely liked it and I, I got a lot of feedback as well. Thank you. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, and thanks for your presence.